thank you all for joining us today for um, our presentation, Technically Speaking. Uh, this is a new series from Perimeter 83, which is the business to business side of the University of Advancing Technology. Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Perimeter 83, uh, we do have a co-working space on site at the UAT campus. And we also offer some additional services like professional service projects, um, customized training for businesses and a certificate program that just recently launched. So if you have any questions about any of those things, please feel free to reach out. I'll put my email in the chat box. Um, my name is JC Smith and I am the business development specialist at Perimeter 83. So I work closely with the university to coordinate things like this, uh, the presentation that we're doing today. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Dave Bullman, the provost of UAT, and he's gonna be doing a presentation today on 2020 tech trends um, from information that he's actually collected through his travels. So uh, welcome, <laughs> Dr. Bowman. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, glad to be here. Hey, everybody. Uh, glad to see you in the room. And uh, it's a pretty fun topic to talk about. The One of the things that's one of the best parts of my job at UAT is I get to keep an eye on technology trends now into the future and try to see where things are going. And we use those to guide our programs so that we make sure that you know, our students experience technology trends in their education just as they hit uh, the, the marketplace to become relevant to everybody. And so one of the things that I get to do is kind of watch these trends play out and talk about them to the staff and to the faculty and students and to the community. And it's really fun stuff because we live in a time where technology and is changing and churning incredibly rapidly. And a lot of the ideas that were just these sort of, you know, blow your mind, fanciful thoughts, are kind of popping up all around us. And so for the next half an hour or so, I'm gonna give you not, certainly not all the technology trends that are happening because there are so, so many. But I'm gonna give you kind of a high level of, of some of the most important ones and we'll, we'll talk for a bit. And at some point, you know, hopefully I'll leave you excited and with ideas kind of streaming out of your thoughts and we'll stop at that point. If there's more, maybe I'll do another one later on this summer that covers the things we didn't get to this time. But uh, as uh, JC said, this is a big piece of what we do with Perimeter and with the university as a whole to make sure that the, our, our community is very vital in promoting a technology ecosystem that allows new ideas to form and, and lets you know, new startups and students you know, build and create and, and kind of find all these new ideas and make them help for everybody. And so it's, uh, with that being said, let me go ahead and share a screen and tell you what I see out there. Now, along the way, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the sidebar, and JC will uh, uh, will pop them out for all of us at, at some point. Uh, some will be at the end. If, if some along the way are relevant while I'm talking, she'll kind of moderate that and pause me so I can talk about it. So here we are at 2020, and it's really, really nice to be able to talk about something that isn't uh, uh, pandemic related. Uh, it, it's, it is, although I'm going to definitely include some conversations about how technology trends are affecting the pandemic and vice versa. Uh, but uh, there's a lot going on this year. And, uh, and what I want you to think about when I talk about technology is that for a bunch of years, we worked on building sort of the, the infrastructure. You know, think of it if you're, if you're imagining a skyscraper that, you know, the, if the 2000s were about, you know, building the inner framework and struts and connectivity of a giant skyscraper, what's happening right now is the fruits of that, where the walls and the flourishes are all kind of coming to place and building off of that. And what we're seeing is ideas that a few years ago were never thought as being near are suddenly becoming possible. And what's really, really fun right now with new technologies is that people are beginning to wrap their heads around, ah, I have this set of tools I never had before. I have an idea to create something that never existed before. And so what's happening this year, and we can expect the next couple of years, is that we're going to see kinds of new technology applications that were like, someone's going to talk to you about them and go, wow, I never thought of that, but that is helpful. And that's what you're always looking for with tech. Um, now, what I do want to say is obviously, you don't have a world event like this pandemic and not have it you know, play out with technology one way or another. Uh, one of the great things though about it is, is that by and large, uh, the, the technologies that are emerging right now are mostly very helpful in helping us navigate the pandemic and find solutions for what we do going forward. And, you know, we're experiencing at this very second. I mean, the fact that we're having, you know, this event with dozens of people, um, 
you know, despite the fact we're all keeping social distance, you know, hopefully you're all wearing masks. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, despite all this, we've been able for a good part of our, uh, of, of our community, despite this pandemic going on worldwide, many of us have been able to conduct our lives. If you're in education, like we are, classes have figured themselves out. If you've, you know, if you've ordered food, you know, we've gotten used to online ordering systems. Uh, we've become very thankful for uh, the, you know, delivery services, you know, that allow us to use the internet to go ahead and bring the goods and services we need to our, to us directly at the house in a way that's relatively safe. And so, technology has made this event, um, uh, you know, much more, uh, I don't want to say enjoyable, but much more livable. Um, and and that's going to continue to play out. Uh, now, one of the big themes that it, everything you're going to hear me talk about is you're going to hear me talk about artificial intelligence many, many, many times. Uh, one of the uh, emerging technologies that has uh, found a foothold in making our lives better or creating new values and new opportunities has been this idea of artificial intelligence. And usually it's not just AI sitting in itself like, boom, here you go. It's AI combined with something else that makes that something else work better. You know, and you're going to see that throughout this presentation. Um, but I want you to, like, before we start talking about it, before I start saying, oh, by the way, now we have, you know, augmented reality with AI, or now we have IoT plus AI. Let me talk to you a little about what AI is and what it isn't. Um, now, the reason why AI has become, you know, a, a thing we're talking about right now is we, the computer scientists have generated, you know, libraries, basically, um, like, like magic black box modules that do AI things that are very easy for people who don't understand AI to use to gather its benefits. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if, if, you know, like, like <laughs> during the pandemic, I decided, well, I needed to upgrade my, my receiver. And so I bought a new receiver that did a better job of HDR, which I'm sure many of you did because we've become very streaming related. I don't know the algorithms behind HDR, but I do know that if I plug an HDMI cable in my receiver, suddenly I get a much better image and much better sounds. A similar thing has happened with AI, where people have figured out how to take all the, you know, the, the algorithms and the smarts, the statistics of AI, they put them in a box that programmers can send signals and questions into the box and what comes out is something they can use. Once that happened, AI became something that could be propagated in many different ways. All you had to do was understand the kind of information it gave you and how to harness it. Um, and you know, one of the things we're seeing coming out of that is that as people, you know, what AI is good at, AI is really, 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 really good at if you give it a lot of data, just dump a, just a dump truck full of data at AI and, and say, look, I'm looking for a pattern. And the pattern looks like this. AI is great at finding those patterns for us. And that's very helpful because one of the things humans aren't really good at is you can't throw a lot of data at us and, and have us quickly find patterns. Our brains aren't designed for that. Um, but AI is. And so, you know, what uh, we're seeing now is, you know, like you're seeing, you know, events where people say, look, you know, I've got statistical information or, or, or community information related to traffic. AI, tell me where the patterns are in terms of where traffic is heavy. It can do that really well. Some of you may have heard about things like doctors using AI. Now, just to be clear, AI cannot tell you if you're sick or not. What AI can do is if a doctor feeds in a historical database of everybody who's ever had a certain type of skin cancer, and then it sends the database a picture of somebody that may or may not have skin cancer, the AI is probably going to do a better job than the humans to say, does it look like prior existing patterns or not? That's what it can do. Um, and, uh, um, and that's what you're seeing people finding out is doing like, you know, over and over again, what AI is doing is give it a lot of data, tell it what a pattern looks like, and then tell me if you see the pattern in other sets of data. And, and so you're seeing here, um, like the, uh, the original AI that was generated for identifying whether something is a cat or an avocado, um, the, you know, you can use that same AI now to go ahead and take a look at genes and find out if a gene is mutated or not. And again, it's all about finding patterns, identifying patterns. And, you know, and that's what's really happened is that what we've done in the last 10 years is computer scientists have built lots of models 
for different kinds of, of, of networks that help AIs identify different kinds of patterns and give us information that we can analyze. Um, and what's interesting is in the last few years, we're also seeing lots of companies who are building their own variations on libraries tailored to certain situations. So for example, something you can expect in the future is if your industry happens to be medicine, you're going to see tailored AIs that solve medicine problems. If your industry is in energy, you'll see energy related AI solutions. You know, just pick your industry and you're seeing companies that work within that industry of different things. Like for example, you're seeing a, a icon here for a chord and you'll notice that through the O you're seeing what looks like a, a staff symbol for music. What a chord does is, is they are an AI that's specifically tuned for identifying music patterns. Um, which if you are somebody who wants to score some work and you're not a musician and you want some help to match existing music to the cadence of what you're doing on film or in a game or something like that, a chord can help match those patterns up for you. And by the way, if you or someone you know wants to uh, get into an industry that has got a lot of growth in the next five years, building AIs that are specifically tuned to an industry is an incredible growth industry. I mean, think about it out there. You've got this toolkit now that kind of generically knows how to find a pattern and tell you something useful. Think of every different kind of job and industry that exists out there. Um, if you can build, you know, if you're, you have any kind of skills in AI and you build a version of an AI that is good in that industry, that is, you know, you go to a client and you say, look, you know, like if you're, if you're a utility company, you can you know, go to them and say, look, do you want to hire an AI scientist to go ahead and build an AI for energy consumption? Or we can just use ours. They're going to say, we're going to do that because that's what we're doing anyway. You know, most companies now rely on providers that are tailored to their solutions. Like as a school, we didn't build our LMS. We hired somebody who's an expert at it. That is what you're going to see. And I'm always going to give any of you guidance who are a computer scientist looking for work, you know, while you're at home from, you know, in, 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 uh, in social distancing. Uh, this is a great area to be in. Uh, and you're just seeing lots of examples of it out there. It's a, you know, you're seeing examples of companies begin to do that and that's going to accelerate it. And what I will say is going forward uh, is that in the next five years, you're going to see more and more tools that, that they may use the word AI in the marketing, but they may not even talk about AI a whole lot. They're just going to be smart tools. They're going to say, hey, this thing is smart. It does this thing smarter than before. And you're going to get better efficiency and better performance out of it. And so it's all related to what I just told you. And you're going to see that in almost every nook and cranny of our lives. Now, what's very, very interesting, though, is even though we call it artificial intelligence, these things are not smart. They're not smart in the way we think of smart in the slightest bit. Um, we are uh, all the emerging technology trends for the near future. Really, uh, what all you're talking about is you've got devices that are very big computers with lots of data, collecting lots of data. because We've got it all coming in from sensors. You've got it coming in from the Internet. We've got all kinds of data sets out there. And all they're able to do very, very well is apply statistics to be able to say something is likely to be like this pattern you showed me. That's what AI is. It doesn't understand that, what it means. Like, for example, when I talked about that music tool, it doesn't know what music is. It just knows, it's just dialed into the rules of music and the nature of music. It just deals with numbers. And very importantly is that AI right now does not understand the implications of the pattern recognition. It doesn't have understanding as we have it. And that will probably be the next evolution of AI. Uh, most of the work uh, that's going on in terms of AI is related to trying to have the, these tools be a little bit smarter to know that here we've got a cute fuzzy mammal with, you know, with, with eyes and nose and ears that we want to hug. Um, but that is not the same as this cute fuzzy mammal that has eyes and ears and nose and we want to hug. You know, an AI would struggle with the difference between that, even though in our brains, we have tons of inferences drawn between these two different kinds of creatures. To an AI, they look pretty similar. Um, and it wouldn't know the difference between a cat and a dog or be able to have a good debate about cats versus dogs. And that's the understanding is that they're very good tools at taking a look at data and telling us if a pattern exists. They, do, they, they don't know what it means. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, if you want to just, you know, kill some time while you're at home on the internet, uh, you know, there are many great stories out there about the things that AI gets wrong. Um, and, and, uh, what's happened here 
is that in this particular algorithm is that uh, the, the statistics involved, um, you know, the, the AI thought that guacamole had a high percent chance of being the same as a cat. Um, what can happen is, is that if you go, if someone edits a picture of something and changes a few of the pixels that get off, that, that, um, that move it off of its base what it is, the AI can't tell the difference. And this is a, as a key idea, the reason why the AI thought the guacamole looked like the cat is because someone had gone in and edited a few pixels in a way that we can't see. And in fact, when we see the pictures of guacamole, we, our brain immediately goes to what is guacamole. We think of it as a holistic entity. When a computer looks at a picture of guacamole, it just looks at the RGB values of each individual pixel um, and just compares how the colors change from one to the other. And the same thing with the cat. We look at that and go, that's a cat. We know what a cat means as a whole. But when an AI looks at a picture of cat, it's looking at a bunch, it's looking at the sequencing of color pixels and the way those patterns form. And if someone messes up with those in a way that we might not even see to our eye, um, it gets confused by that. And if you take this out, you know, you're gonna see lots of different examples where AI confuses a blueberry muffin with a chihuahua, um, confuses a, a stack of KFC uh, uh, chicken with uh, 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 these poodleish dogs that are reddish fur. And it's because AIs right now do not understand what, what these things mean. Um, and so what you're gonna hear about, and it's not there yet, you know, like what I'm going to tell you the next five years, if you're going to be involved in AI, be involved in, in tailoring existing AI tools to specific applications. That's where the future is. And it's going to produce good things. If you're a computer scientist, and you want to look deeper into the future and into the kind of issues we're going to try and solve in 2025 to 2030. It's going to be figuring out how to have AI understand that it's not just a bunch of pictures of guacamole, that that's guacamole. And that's what guacamole means. Um, that is the next level. It still won't mean they're smart. It just means it has it's understanding things a bit holistically. So if any of you are worrying about the Terminator uh, with AI, I think you know, you've got at least another 10, 15 years before Skynet's an even a beginning issue. Nothing is that close to it. They, 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 they just, we're not there. You're safe. Don't worry about it. Okay. So there's what AI is, what it isn't. Um, and uh, let me just talk now about where, where it goes and what it can do. Obviously, you know, it's this idea of autonomous stuff. Um, you know, I mean, I, the number of uh, 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 things I see lately that are stories related to autonomous drones and bots and whatnot is amazing. Like I was watching last night, was at the gym. Uh, I was watching the final episode of Krasinski's Some Good News, um, which is awesome, by the way, as most of you probably know. And they're doing a story in there about drones dropping um, um, care packages off to people. You know, we're seeing, you know, how AI is helping some devices navigate things safely. Um, and, and that's a big piece of where AI is, 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 is being applied. And it's very exciting because uh, you can do things that are very hard for us as humans to accomplish. Um, they still don't know what it means, but they can do it. One of the things you're likely to see in the next few years that it's going to be kind of fun is we're going to begin to see kind of the next level of what, you know, an Alexa device looks like moving around our homes. And uh, this is a Samsung device. Uh, and uh, the, I, outside of, the, of this uh, presentation, just for fun, go take a look at the video for this device. It's, a, it's called the Samsung Intelligent Robot. And, you know, or if you just Google up, uh, you know, Samsung, you know, yellow ball robot, you'll probably find a really adorable video that, that, that shows this thing in action. And, and what, actually, wait, I can do that for you. There we go. I embedded it. Hopefully you can see this. Oh, well. Uh, it is blank. You're not seeing it? No. Now, if you can see this, I'm hoping you can. Um, this is an example of where AIs are going to move into, where we have small devices that can do facial recognition or product recognition and are integrated with other devices in our house. Um, 
Yeah, and the image that Samsung is presenting right here is this idea that the uh, um, that its device is integrated to your television and other consumer products. It knows who you are. It knows who your pets are. And as you'll see in a second, if the pet makes a spill, it can link up with other devices like your you know your you know your IoT robot, and it can vacuum it up. Um, this is the kind of thing that we can expect AI to, to do more and more of for us. Uh, did that come through by chance? No, I didn't see anything. All right. That's a, um, I couldn't tell it, it was coming up on my screen. And, uh, um, but anyway, if uh, uh, go look up this video and you'll find and, and it will show up. Um, but what you're going to start seeing with AI is this idea that we're going to have useful smallish devices that are going to provide, you know, incrementally more useful functionality than an Alexa does. You know, and some of if you if you've got you know any of the, uh, the 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 AI enabled robots, you kind of know what that's like around your house. You're going to see that propagate more and more um, in in different parts of our lives. Uh, and you know, in various ways, you're going to see that will be. Um, if you look to the left, that image um, is it's kind of a prototype version of an image, but essentially that is this idea of it's a container. You put something in it, you tell it where to go, and it can navigate its way and deliver something someplace else. I think the next of, of uh, uh, applications of AI in devices and bots are going to have that theme all over the place, where you know we we have all this infrastructure of maps and GPS locations and the algorithms for devices to not bump into walls and people have gotten pretty good and so you know you can now build systems where you can say rather than me walking this over to somebody here in a container off you go uh, and sometimes they have faces you know sometimes they have cute faces uh, I'm not quite sure that some of these devices are going to be quite as popular. I think we're going to lean personally, at least in the United States, we're going to lean towards devices that are more um, unobtrusive, like that, uh, like that small ball. Uh, but you never know. Um, some, there's, there's, there are ideas out there that we will have a little bit little humanish butlers that will roam around and do things for us. Um, maybe uh, in bigger spaces, certainly. Uh, one of the most clever things I've seen uh, with AI that was being tested before the pandemic hit with malls and kind of put everything in a, in a, in a, in a shaker state uh, is uh, the one of the larger malls in Arizona was beginning to experiment with similar kinds of devices that held things that you would call one, it would come to you in the mall, you'd put your, your bag of stuff in it, it would close and secure and either follow you around like a puppy, or it would go back to a sort of secure location and wait that way you'd have to lug your stuff. That's sort of an example of the properties we're going to begin to see in low-grade AI. Um, in commercial areas, of course, we're seeing larger companies like Amazon using this sort of mobile um, and smart device to handle inventory movement. Um, like I say, it, Amazon has made this famous in the way that their factories um, use AI and robots to go ahead and gather products, put things on shelves, and deliver them to packaging systems. Um, I think we're going to see that more and more and more. Uh, there's some nascent uh, uh, conversations out there about using AI and bots for um, uh, as companions for for care. I think this is pretty early on, personally. I think that say that maybe someday um, we'll see something like this. Uh, last night, uh, the family was huddled around Disney Plus watching Big Hero Six. You know, and I think that's probably a closer ultimate state of it. But you got to start somewhere, and you're beginning to see people experiment with ways that. Um, uh, the loads in medical care facilities could be offset by having bots that would travel from room to room, interact with patients, and and take care of some of the needs. And then I could see that potentially. I mean, you like one of the things that whenever I visited folks who've been at the hospital that drives people crazy is when you sit in the bed and you click the thing and you're waiting for an attendant or a nurse to arrive and you got to wait for it. Obviously, you know they're not there to torture you. You know they're there because they're talking to other patients. If a, a small bot could be dispatched to take care of a couple of things for you that's within their scope immediately, that might be a better care experience. We might see some of that kicking in. Uh, one of my favorite uh, experiments that's playing out nationally, um, it was in Arizona recently, and it's, it's currently going on. At, uh, the same test model by Neuro is being conducted in Texas. Um, I, believe, I believe it's in Dallas. 
Um, and it's this idea that you may have heard of where uh, groceries are being delivered to your house via autonomous bots. Expect that to extend. And if anything, probably the pandemic is going to accelerate the interest in that. Um, and essentially what you're looking at, uh, and this is the pizza version of it, by the way, um, you know, and it's, these are these bots that, you know, you, you know, you, you, you call in on, you know, go online on your mobile device, you order your pizza, you order your groceries, you order your whatever, someone loads it at the shop and these devices can deliver it to your house, send you a signal to your mobile device that it's ready and you pick it up and go. Uh, this was intriguing before the pandemic. Certainly, if these had been further along and not just in test phase, they would have been heavily used across the pandemic. Uh, because again, at that moment where you're, con you know, you're concerned about minimizing human contact, this is a solution to that. And, you know, and, and depending on who you are and your situation, uh, this is incredibly important. Uh, I've got a family member uh, who has got a profoundly uh, compromised immune system. And throughout this entire three month experience, they, they haven't been, you know, masks aren't an option. I mean, uh, like, like she has been in a situation where she has been in zero contact and she's likely to be in zero contact until the end of the year or until vaccines come and tested and then verify that, you know, that, that she can't be interacted with or she can be safely interacted with even a little bit. A solution like this would make her world much, much better um, if more of what she could get could be just rapidly and incrementally delivered to her house uh, with one less station of human contact. I suspect post-pandemic, you're going to see devices like this rapidly accelerate through the community. Um, and uh, an example, uh, uh, you know, kind of following on that note, um, during the last month uh, in Florida, the Mayo Clinic used, you know, for the very same reasons I pointed out, they had completely autonomous uh, vehicles that were delivering uh, medical supplies and things like that to patients. Again, trying to find ways to eliminate humans when there's when there's a high risk of infection. Uh, there are many other applications for autonomous devices, but what you often see with new technologies is that it is some sort of emergent need out there that drives them suddenly popping up and becoming a thing. And so we can see a lot, in fact, you see a lot of this happening. Um, and in fact, the the whole autonomous vehicle adoption rate is fully expected to grow and probably even go more rapidly than this. Um, what this uh, is showing basically is if you take a look at the blue is it's the number of vehicles in dark blue represents your car that are fully autonomous. Um, the light gray is the number of vehicles that have some autonomous in them and the dark gray represents traditional cars. And what you're seeing, and this is put out by the auto industry, is their predictions are that within 25 years, uh, the notion of a car like ours that doesn't have some kind of autonomous feature is the deep, deep minority. Uh, and in fact, looking um, forward into 2025, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the percentage of cars that have some feature of autonomous in them is the majority. That is spot on accurate. Uh, you can fully expect that within five years, the you know, things like backup indicators that became normalized around uh, like three or four years ago, you're going to see some kind of safety semi-autonomous thing become normalized in vehicles, predominantly about safety. It won't be, you know, these won't be drive the car and sit back. What these will be is that in an unsafe situation, they'll take care of the car, take control of the car and prevent an accident, um, prevent you from running into something, prevent you from into a lane to somebody else. Um, you know, they will come on from a safety thing. If you need, um, you know, one of my favorite scenes in that classic movie, Plane, Trains, and Automobiles is the late night drive to Chicago where John Candy is trying to reach something and his jacket gets stuck because he's got to have his hands on the wheel. He can't let go. You'll probably see some features in cars emerge that for short periods of time, you'll be able to safely let go of the wheel so you can adjust something, reach for something or whatever, um, and it will hold control for you. I think that is going to become normal very, very quickly, especially if you say, hey, I'm getting sleepy. I need to pull off. Uh, in fact, most of marketing based around this that I've seen in test phases has looked like that. Similarly, you're going to see drones appear everywhere. Um, we're already seeing them all over the place. Um, uh, this is an example of, uh, of drones doing an aerial dance. Um, I'm pointing this here because it's kind of neat looking. Um, but what I will say is that 
we have algorithms in place now that allow drones to, without human control, to be able to make determinations and do relatively smart things. Uh, this means that we can fully expect that drones to be used more and more for scouting, delivery, um, observation, things like that in the field. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, off to the left is a simulation of how drones uh, are, you can be used in the city as essentially tools to identify if there is a fire, if there is a water leak, a power leak, if there's a car accident. Um, it's a way to rapidly deploy um, cameras to be able to identify what's going on before people are sent. Um, and if you're a city and a community concerned about how do you provide better and faster service, you know, with, 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 you know, without spending more money on extra human infrastructure that way, drones represent a really good solution for that. And increasingly, we trust drones. We we're kind of getting more and more used to them. We've got concerns about privacy. Uh, we have concerns about camera. But generally speaking, the percentage of families who own a drone, you know, and, and have been playing with one of their house and gone, wow, this is pretty easy to fly these days. Let's just take a picture of, of our front yard. Means that we're getting comfortable with them being in our presence, which is a big key in emerging technologies being accepted. And so you can expect in the next five years, you're just going to start seeing drones being used for very focused purposes. And again, like, like I think about it, if nothing else, like in construction sites or things like that, where relative to sending somebody out to a corner of a site if something's going on um, and having to walk out, check on something and walk back, you know, if you are, if you've got somebody who's got some specific knowledge and needs to verify something, the ability to fly a drone out really quickly, take a look and come back is invaluable and much easier and a much better use of time. Uh, and a, a fun story that, uh, that came out of the spring was, uh, it, you may recall back in March, uh, March, April, uh, at the early stages of the national shutdown, uh, Florida was, a tr was attempting to navigate what to do with beaches and spring breakers. And so Daytona Beach deployed drones and to identify where people were. So they knew where to send uh, uh, law enforcement out to say, hey, quit it, social distance or whatever. Um, you're going to see this more and more um, as a tool. Again, whenever you've got a situation where you're trying to find an efficient use of gathering information before sending humans out, drones are going to be the go-to. And we can expect that for quite some time. Um, and pretty soon we're probably going to see people taking out drones. Uh, and the implications of what happens if, you know, a drone comes and someone, th someone throws a rock at it. Uh, you know, I, I actually, I am waiting for the next couple of year release of drones that have written into their algorithms some kind of sensor that it detects if something is being thrown at it so they can take evasive maneuvers. That will in no way surprise me um, if, if we'll start seeing that happen. Um, Drones are being used in this uh, post-pandemic uh, to provide that same kind of role that the neuro vehicles were, uh, delivery of, uh, of, of goods and services. And again, I think this is a, a use that we're going to see, especially knowing that the pandemic in some form is likely to be with us for quite some time. Um, it will probably spur on um, you know, a desire to go ahead and accelerate something that commercial like retail centers were trying to do anyway, which is how can we use drones to go ahead and deliver payloads of things to people? Um, and, and now you've got a reason that's a compelling reason for it. So I would say looking forward, expect to see far more of this happening. Um, and then we'll learn what pieces work and what pieces don't work. Uh, agriculture is a big piece of it, by the way. Um, the, one of the great challenges of agriculture is, send, is identifying what's going on in crops. Um, you've got large amounts of space increasingly uh, the agriculture industry is getting comfortable using drones to go ahead and check on the status of crops, um, are there diseases, are there dry spots, um, are there disruptions, um, and just reporting back. What I find hilarious about this is that increasingly farming is looking just like the very first, the true first Star Wars movie when I was a kid. Um, you know, when you had Luke out, of, out on the farm, you know, it was a small family farm collecting water and they had a lot of droids. Um, that actually is increasingly becoming the truth for the agriculture industry. And I would say for those of you who are looking for another industry to get involved in, in a tech space, really look at building tech for agriculture. The, the challenge out there in the world is how do we provide, you know, continue to provide food, do it in a way that with less um, pesticides and chemicals, you know, less use of engineered food crops. Obviously the desire right now is to have, you know, 
crops that have not been modified scientifically, uh, don't use, not using pesticides, uh, use less water um, and produce high yields. And that's a pretty interesting tall order to generate uh, on, on a food supply system. Interestingly, having uh, uh, AI enabled drones helps having AI tools that monitor water patterns and micro weather patterns makes a huge difference for this. And the, the farming industry is uh, actually not tech adverse. You just have to be able to show that it's rugged, it's easy to use, and it provides a benefit to crops. And interestingly, we're on the cusp for that. Uh, it's one of the most interesting areas of tech space. It isn't talked about a whole lot, um, but it's actually probably going to affect um, our lives in a way we don't see because it's going to be part of the solution of how we get better quality food, um, you know, going forward. Um, and then you can just, if you, if you go to the tech uh, shows, you see how John Deere is, uh, interestingly, is deeply involved in this process. They have a, you know, they're investing deeply into robotics within their equipment and AI within their equipment and tool sets for the agriculture industry. Um, now, the next thing you need to look for in terms of technology trends, I kind of blew past the slide, I apologize, uh, is IoT. It's a term you've probably all heard. And what you, what you really want to understand is that going forward, that IoT is going to be something that is part of our lives. And it is that extension of, if I talked about AI to start, and then I talked about drones next, the natural extension of that is, um, is Internet of Things devices. And you know, you're seeing here a, a pretty amazing number going on. And this is worldwide, the total number of IoT devices going on. And you're seeing that in, um, uh, in 2015, there were about 3.8 billion IoT devices worldwide. And in 10 years, that goes to about 21 and a half billion worldwide. And that's worldwide. That means you know, accounting for areas where you aren't, you know, you don't have the kind of technology infrastructure that you might have in a city in the United States or Europe, places like that. This is everywhere. If you were to look at a typical city in the U.S. or, or, you know, or you know, you're going to see the number of IoT devices is substantially higher than this. Um, and you know, the, you know, the trend is just getting bigger and just getting bigger. And you know, you're getting to a point where the number of devices per person is growing dramatically to the point where you look forward five years from now, nothing really. Um, each person walking around is going to have probably nine or 10 IoT devices. And that's worldwide. I would say that in the United States, the number is going to be a lot closer to about 13 devices per person that are hooked up to the internet. That's amazing. Um, and why is this happening? Why do we care? What is an, what, you know, why do we care about IoT? Uh, what IoT means, you hear people talk about it, it's this idea that you are going to have a number of you know, these devices that are actually smallish, unobtrusive, relatively powerful, and they're connected to the internet in some way. And they're probably connected to some kind of cloud data storage, and they're probably connected to some kind of AI. Those are sort of the baseline elements that make up an IoT. And what that gives you is a way to provide streaming information about whatever, the I, whatever that device is, is all about. You know, if it's a weather IoT device, um, it's telling you what the current microclimate is, or maybe the humidity, or the, you know, the temperature, the, the air pressure, um, whatever. If it's a location IoT, you know, perhaps it's measuring traffic in a certain area. Um, if it's, uh, if any of you are like me and you are uh, become part of the world where you've got a smartwatch, that's an IOT device. You know, it's gathering information about my health, my location, uh, and it's connected to a greater system. It's connected to a cloud-based computing system, and I'm getting a fair bit of services related to this. Uh, this is a relatively new phenomena and it's incredibly powerful because what that means, having a lot of IOT devices provides a way to collect data that, that AIs can make good decisions based on and give us information that we find helpful. You know, you wanna find um, uh, from a medical perspective, if you are, you know, uh, if you're interested in about the current state of your health or the predictive nature of your health, uh, one of the things that uh, about 600,000 people in the US die every year 
due to um, heart related illness. That's a big number. Put in perspective, uh, like the pandemic so far has killed about 90,000 people. And granted, it's a different issue. You can catch a pandemic and it's still growing. But 600,000 people dying of heart, uh, heart related uh, situations is a much bigger number. It's a pretty good, it's, it's a big deal. Interestingly, a good number of heart uh, illness related deaths occur. Um, they have precursive body signals that we as humans are unable to detect, especially if you're a woman. Uh, smartphones are increasingly picking up on your heart patterns and your blood pressure patterns connected to an, an AI system, you know, you'll be able to get uh, very soon, I believe, you know, signals from your watch saying, hey, you probably feel fine, but something weird just happened with your body. You should go see a doctor relatively soon. And the idea is, is that in this way, we will actually be able to reduce the number of heart deaths uh, because you've got these devices that are, are, are attached to pattern sensing systems and cloud databases, and they give you feedback in an early way. Imagine that with energy, power, usage, uh, food, any number of things. Um, that's what an IoT device is. That little drone bot that's a little rolling ball. And by the way, whenever uh, if you watch that video, the, the, the obvious thing that is a, is a hoot is that this thing is a small ball and they're doing it with a dog. My dog would pick that ball up in its mouth and carry it away. Uh, but that being said, most of what's going on, that's a good example of an IoT device. I mean, it, it's got a small computer, it's gathering information, video information, you know, location information, signals from other IoT devices. And, you know, together it's able to do useful small stuff that we value. Um, and that's what it's about. Things that you can expect to see with IoT, uh, a lot of it related to the food industry. Uh, the, we are increasingly interested in the quality of our food, where it comes from. IoT devices are probably going to be used increasingly to track where food is in the production pipeline, probably as ways to let us know exactly where a food you know, was sourced from, um, because people care about it. Uh, you're going to see IoT devices in goofy ways. Uh, I think this has got a video attached to it. This is a really goofy way. Um, this is uh, IoT uh, shower systems. Uh, basically, your shower is attached to music, which is attached to Alexa. It's also attached to glowing LED lights. So if you have a shower, you can have a little micro concert going on. Uh, IoT is, is likely going to show up in most appliances uh, in some form or another to provide efficiency or basically to sell more appliances because it's sort of cool. I think a lot of IoT things are going to happen in the next few years are going to be kind of goofy. Um, but we'll figure out what we value and we don't. And that's an important thing to think about with technology. You try stuff, and if it has value, it sticks. If it doesn't have value, we laugh at it, and we tell jokes about it, and it shows up on late-night television, and we walk away from it. Um, but, you know, you'll likely see things with um, uh, IoT embedded in food equipment will allow uh, the device itself to perhaps be tied up to master um, uh, recipes things so that it, it allows you know, for more focused kind of mixes. Now I'll give you kind of a, a not exactly an IOT device uh, example, but uh, I make a lot of bread. I always have, even pre-pandemic. And I used to always, uh, uh, you know, like knead my bread in a mixer. I kind of stopped doing that because I've got a bread machine that has programmed into it, you know, cycles for kneading and temperature that are um, for different styles of bread. And so it just does it better than I can. They're just, you know, like I, I would, I'd have to put so much energy into, into coming up with the right sequence and temperature and humidity to go ahead and eat bread. It, it has a sensor that does that for me. Um, you know, it's only, it's the only thing it's missing is it's not connected to Wi to Wi-Fi. But it's that kind of a thing that you're going to start seeing where increasingly our devices are connected and you know so that they 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 tap into a more nuanced, refined approach to things. Uh, actually, my favorite absolutely goofy uh, IoT device that I've seen this last year is a toaster that you can go ahead and pick up to your phone and you can have uh, uh, emoji icons or phrases uh, and, you know, like coded in. So when the toast pops out, um, you, can, you can have a friendly image and, and, or, or words uh, to your kids as you head them out the door in the morning for breakfast. It's, it's kind of awesome fun. Uh, also, in a, in a goofy way, uh, I'm not going to show you the video, uh, but go look at the smart potato. Uh, this is a, it's a twist on that old science experiment we always did as kids where we, um, you know, we would use potatoes and hook them up to us, you know, as a battery and do stuff. Well, someone went ahead and put a, a small chip inside this antenna 
you can plug it into a potato and it powers it up to an internet device and you can have a, the smart potato app on your phone and, and you can do some rudimentary AI-ish things with a potato. It's mostly silly. It's this, it's this generation's version of a pet rock, but it does show how with technology emerges, there's a wonderful thing where people are creative with it for a while, um, which is kind of fun. And actually what I want to do is I close on this on IoT is I'm going to talk about as a pandemic. Um, I, if you try to get your, your head wrapped around what, where is IoT really, really useful, um, think about what we're faced with in the, with this pandemic. Um, the, you've got worldwide, you know, a virus that is out there and is affecting many people in many different situations. We don't, we have a growing amount of data and we're trying to figure out how to respond. Uh, what you need is lots of information and lots of different settings. And of course, traditional science makes a lot of sense, you know, like, like capturing patients, doing classic science stuff is in a lab is super, super helpful. Um, but what's even more helpful is the ability to be able to gather live data out there in the world at real times that you can then correlate and figure out, you know, what's happening. And the uh, and you know like one of the topics you've probably all read about is this idea about you know going and doing contact tracing. Like how can we contact trace? That's a really complex topic to be able to see where people are and connect with other people, and how does that relate to where you know a virus could be moving? IoT devices give us that ability. If if you know that nearly everybody has some kind of IoT connected device. You know, and yeah, you know, and somehow you know, you know, like something like a phone like this or a, a, a smartwatch, you can and, and you they give permission to say, look, go ahead and contact track me within these set of parameters. Now you begin to build a world network that watches and you can see where something moves, which allows scientists to not only predict behavior patterns of a virus, but also be able to quickly move back and notify, you know, from the contact tracking, like, hey, wait, you Three or four moments back, you contacted somebody who ultimately had this disease. We can now reach you and, and give you a test with much more precision. And it's that sort of distributed, fast, low obnoxious precision is really what IoT brings to the table. And so there's a lot. I mean, I think you may see that uh, uh, if things are organized properly, that IoT solutions um, are going to play out a great deal in our response to this pandemic. Um, and so, and it also gives you a good idea, like, like, like beyond the pandemic, how this combination of artificial intelligence, cloud services, mobile devices, IoT, drones, how they all kind of weave together to create one of the most important technology trends that we're facing right now. Now, I think at this moment, this is sort of where I'm going to go ahead and stop. Um, I think like, there's many, many more technologies to talk about, but this is a nice theme. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share for a second. Um, and I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to submit them in, in the uh, chat box there on the bottom. If you're using the web or the uh, client, the Zoom client, there is an option to click on chat. Um, so please definitely feel free. If you have any feedback, definitely let us know. There's also a Q&A box too, but uh, really just trying to get the questions out here. Um, Amelia asked, what do you predict in the workforce hiring process? Uh, well, one of the obvious things we're facing right now is we're doing far more interviews using this technology. Uh, and the, uh, uh, I know that uh, this may be one of those things that may last even beyond the pandemic, um, is that you know, there are some activities that just work better in a Zoom channel once you've kind of figured out how to use it. Um, and so I think we're going to be seeing this format happening quite a bit. Uh, what I do think, though, in terms of like the hiring process is, you know, if you're looking for a job, be aware that uh, increasingly companies are going to check your social um, and, uh, the, and, and they have every right to do so. Um, I mean, it's a there's nothing that prevents, you know, unless you've locked it down, that nothing that prevents them doing global searches on social media to see what you're doing. And so be aware that um, if, you know, if there are photos of you doing something that are embarrassing you, uh, a company may look at that during the hiring process. Uh, you know, one of the things that isn't out there, but is, is you could see a potential on it is like, when UAT recruits people, uh, what we're looking for is 
we are looking for people who are really a good fit to our culture. We've got a very distinctive kind of culture about looking for smart people and friendly people and people who love students. And there's just some things, you know, like agile uh, kind of people in terms of new ideas. And, you know, it is not inconceivable. Like remember I talked about how there could be, you know, these libraries for AI are emerging. Imagine a library for AI that uh, based upon, um, whatever kind of input parameter, uh, looking at your resume, looking at your LinkedIn, looking at your background or whatever, this AI was able to kind of do some predictives of, you know, how much of a match this person is uh, into your culture. You know, you obviously make the decision on it and it would, and, uh, but, you know, one of the, you know, this pattern recognizing tool might be something that just, you know, could be used to go ahead and give people another, hiring people a lens on, is this person suited for this kind of culture or this kind of job? Uh, because one of the truths is, is not everybody is suited for every kind of job and some people are better suited for it. If there's a way to, if there was a tool that kind of pattern your past behaviors or whatever, anyway, you, you can see something like that. I think it's a little further out, but that's one of the things that uh, you could see. Yeah. We have a couple, a couple other ones. Yeah. Um, Mayra asked when our next meeting is, there is an event scheduled for June 3rd on how to spot phishing attempts. Um, so any events that we have scheduled, you can always find on our Eventbrite and feel free to just search for Perimeter 83 and Eventbrite and then register for those as they come up. Um, Dr. Utsky, I apologize, I probably just uh, butchered your last name there, um, typed, I hope, uh, I'm hoping in the near future we can have a conversation about DLT, distributed ledger technology and digital currency mm -hmm. in the changing landscape of traditional banking and finance. Um, definitely fintech is something that is up and coming and trending, and I really hope to see the use of blockchain in the finance world more. I think it's a perfect application for that personally. Um, and then Lace asked, what do I do if I want to research it more and some articles online may not relate? The um, Lace, uh, for research, are you looking, uh, could you dial in your question a little bit? Are you looking for research more on IoT or, or what? And if you send us an email, Actually, any of you, uh, send an email to Dave, D-A-V-E, at UAT.edu. I'm more than happy to give you uh, some information about uh, where I drew my data from. Um, and Dr. Utsky, I suspect we probably will do some kind of fintech blockchain, um, uh, uh, you know, distributed technology uh, presentation relatively soon. That's something that UAT has been involved with. And, you know, its application both in cyber and in the fintech world. Um, it's something they're very interested in. And so I suspect that within the next three to six months, we'll likely do a presentation on that. Uh, because one of the things I'm seeing in my trend, I didn't get to it in my deck today, but many indications are showing that after an initial hype mode a couple, three years ago on blockchain, it quieted down, but now it's emerging back up again. And, and even though it's not getting quite as much press as it once did, in terms of meaningful application, What's happened in the last couple of years is not that the technology has vanished. It's just that people have gone back to their and, and, and you know, companies and labs and have begun creating with it and solving some problems. And you're going to, I think we're, we're on the cusp of seeing another wave of application that we're talking about. And so you can probably expect us to do some pieces with that. Perfect. Well, it looks like we got another one that popped in here. Um, yes, I can definitely send you some information um, by mail. I should have your email address here, but if not, just feel free to message it to me and I can send you more information about this. Um, we will also turn this presentation into a recording that will be available on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can check out our YouTube for Perimeter 83 to see previous presentations as well. So, all right, any other questions? Comments, concerns about Terminator taking over? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, what do uh, cats, dogs, and guacamole have in common? Those are all topics that we covered in today's presentation. <laughs> um, so it's definitely great information on uh, upcoming trends. Um, all right, so I don't see any other questions there. So with that, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bowman, for the information that you provided. Uh, it was Absolutely. really great to kind of learn some different trends and things. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can uh, email me at jsmith at perimeter83.com, uh, but you should be receiving a follow-up email from me here in the next few days. Um, so yeah, thank you again, and I uh, hope you all have a great afternoon. It's great spending time with you. Take care, all. <laughs>